welcome back from lunch and welcome to the standards and specifications forum track here at Open Source Summit North America. Um, we are really glad to have you here. I made a crack earlier about how, you know, standards really brings out the crowd and, you know, here, here we are. Um, but uh, we're doing this because we do want to foster more um, inter-organizational collaboration between all of our standards and specifications communities that are hosted at the Linux Foundation and also um, the communities that they collaborate with through alliances and liaison agreements and things like that because that is how we build. We build together. And so uh, my dear friend, I like to call you my friend now, Allison Richards from Intel um, is going to uh, take it away and tell us how they are doing it at UXL Foundation. Yes, thank you so much for that fantastic uh, intro, Tori. And next time I definitely want some walk-on music. It's really loud and fun. And uh, I just wanted to say, I know I'm between you and the end of a fantastic conference and a, and a long week though. So I'll try to keep to it. If you guys do have any questions along the way, feel free or um, just let me know. We can engage in a dialogue because we you know, have um, time and you know, I have some slides, but we can also veer off. So. One of the things that um, we wanted to talk about here is just that the technology industry is changing and historically developers have been used to CPU exclusively for data processing, uh, apart from in the graphics space. But this change has really been accelerated by AI and it's been happening for a few years in the high performance computing space. But um, you know, now with the acceleration of AI, it's just been like this big boom and there aren't as many standards in that space to make it easy for developers. So all of the top supercomputers in the world are now predominantly using GPUs alongside CPUs to power large science applications. But the recent use of GPUs has exploded, as we've talked about in the AI space, and it's um, driven by the need for better performance when executing matrix operations and those that are well suited to run on GPUs, since they have the ability to process a lot of um, data in parallel. So the challenge that exists now is that the software stacks that are being developed for these processors is often on a proprietary implementation and it's closed source. So this is a big opportunity for us to change this. And just talking to some of you in the audience, you know, those are, those are pain points. So how do we address that together? So solving the challenge of diverse hardware acceleration, you can see here, you know, that what we wanted to do is have a programming model that's open, standards-based, and really helps you move across CPU, GPU, FPGA, and accelerators. So there's a demand for acceleration at the edge, edge AI, HPC, and in AI. And developers really don't want to have to program in different ways for different devices, because that is just laborious. It takes a lot of time, um, money. They have to learn new things. So the one API specification is one of the solutions for providing a programming model across these architectures. Open, standards-based, and uh, it gives folks an alternative to run their code on NVIDIA and on other vendor GPUs and accelerators, including Intel hardware. So since I'm from Intel, I just had to mention that point, but we also work with ARM and you know, Qualcomm, other processor vendors. We're very, very open about that. So the motivation really comes from growing performance requirements in terms of different types of applications with data intensive workloads like AI, media, and um, people really want to get power efficiency also for the different workloads. Evans Data Corporation has found that 48% of developers today are targeting heterogeneous systems defined as using more than one kind of processor or core. So this requires unique languages, tools, and libraries and added complexity for developers, and it limits code reuse. So is it consistent tools to support cross-platform means that developers have to waste a lot of time learning different sets of tools, developing software for each hardware platform, and that requires a separate investment with little ability to reuse that work across target architectures. So our foundation, the UXL Foundation, really aims to deliver a solution to these challenges, providing an open, standards-based, multi-architecture programming model that provides true, free, true freedom of choice across accelerators while maximizing developer productivity. So I know that's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, 
So the mission that we came up with for the UXL Foundation is to build a multi-architecture, multi-vendor software ecosystem. And we launched this last September, on September 19th, at the OSS Bilbao in Jim Zemlin's keynote. And the real goal is to tackle this problem that I've just described. So what's clear is we need the community, we need alliances, we need a lot of people to get together to actually make this a reality. So together, we really feel like we can build a large open ecosystem for accelerated compute. The foundation builds on a solid base of a um, mature set of specs and open source projects. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how they work together and what the need is and some of the challenges that come up that we could hopefully together resolve. So open ecosystems really create a horizontal platform for the next generation of innovation. And open technologies have powered the last decade of innovation and surely will power the next decade. So we really do wanna give developers choice to do what they want and um, you know, drive open, free, and um, getting the lowest level of software done by the vendors with standards and you know, optimizing the code. So we think that all of you can be a big part of this journey. So the One API specification, how many of you guys in the audience are familiar with One API? Okay, quite a few, great. Um, so here are the elements that are currently, you know, within the specification. So you can see this project contains both open source code and we also aim to give fundamental building blocks for the developers. There are libraries for math operations, AI, multi-node systems like supercomputers. There's also a library that implements ISO standard C++ parallel routines. Together, these projects provide the fundamental basics for most of the software, um, delivering highly optimized APIs for things like BLAS and convolutions. And we know that developers want to use a single API to write their code for multi-vendor and multi-architecture. So that's the aim of this, open accelerated compute and heterogeneous architectures that, you know, they're multi-vendor. So our goal is to do a vendor neutral ecosystem and you know, the basis of that is one API, this one API spec. We're very open to having other specs potentially come in, discussing other things from other companies. So we're not you know, just limited to this, but that's pretty much our starting point. So I just wanted to share this slide so you can see the journey to the foundation. So in 2019 in Denver at Supercomputing, we hosted our first One API Technical Advisory Board. We had a preliminary spec at the time. So it was you know, really nascent. We'd spent maybe six months trying to get a spec out the door that we could get feedback on. And we focused on language at the time because that was a key part of it, the, the language piece of it. So we had a language technical advisory board. And then we delivered the spec in 2020 with input that we got from this technical advisory board. And then we held a developer summit in 2020. It was the first One API developer summit where we got folks to talk a little bit about what they were doing. We had you know, some uh, customers, some labs and other folks, universities that were playing around with One API, if you will. And so the spec line is at the top and the open source is at the bottom. And one of the most exciting things that I can say uh, I got to witness happening was when uh, for the Fugaku supercomputer in Japan, Fujitsu and Riken together worked on one DNN for the ARM CPU. And Kentaro Kawakami, who is with Fujitsu Labs, he wrote a developer journey about this. And it's a blog, you can find it out on the internet. But um, he was really excited to find this open source software and he you know, gave his input in to Intel and to ARM. And so he would go to sleep in Japan and then hear back from the Intel and ARM folks. And, and his input got put into what you know, is the one DNN spec. So that was really exciting. And there was also work uh, with NVIDIA AMD targets that were added to both one MKL and one DNN spec. So all of this, uh, from the spec to open source projects and these being you know, out in the open and then people contributing to them has been great. So then we also created technical advisory boards for math, for AI and um, language, 
And then I think we had one other that I'll have to remember. So we have these now have trans transformed into UXL uh, sig um, SIGs that any of you guys can attend, and we, we welcome you there. So this is, these are the members of our foundation, and we are looking to get new members, both at the steering committee level, the general level, as well as contributing members. So I've told you a little bit about our goal and our mission, but really we wanna engage with you guys and collaborate across the industry, and that is where you, know, you guys can help. Bringing together companies, designing processors, and software developers looking for performance has historically been the best way to success. And we're able to build on the one API specification, the open source implementations that we initially talked about five years ago, and then drive this forward. So we are also collaborating with standards bodies and foundations, and we'll be announcing some of these soon. So now I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges, you know, and I've given you a little bit of background, but there are definite challenges on doing this. It's not a cakewalk, and it takes a long time, as you probably know, to get standards and specs and to work together as a community. So the first one is a problem that exists within standardization. Historically, that's been something that's done through consensus, voting, and discussion. So that takes time. And so uh, I, ISO C++, for example, uh, proposals can be in progress for years at a time when they were scrutinized, discussed, ratified, refined, et cetera. And with the specification, we wanted to be able to move fast and make sure we're keeping the promise that we make to developers. And so the second important thing is providing targets that span multiple processor vendors. So it's important that if a developer does write code and there's an expected behavior regardless of the vendor processor that's being used. So this has been solved in the CPU space already, but it's definitely not in the accelerator space. And so I think that's what some of you guys are interested in here. And then the third is important for our foundation because we have dependencies on other standards. And so we want to forge worthwhile relationships with other organizations, uh, foundations, and bodies, but we don't want to have it you know, kind of slow us down too much. So there's some magic in how we work together and do that. So moving fast while keeping promises to the developers. So obviously, software developers uh, really just want to be productive and happy when they write code. So they want things to just work. And they want to use you know, uh, code and languages that they already know. You know. That's what's really important. And our foundation has um, both a spec and an open source implementation. So we want to ensure that that specification forms a contract between the developer using the project and the project team. And it's really important that the project follows the specification. So it's also true that the software development moves faster than the specs are agreed upon. And so that's why we want the open source project teams and the community to be able to innovate and develop new features for experimentation. And to find that balance, we have to determine a set of rules for releases that you know, meet these expectations that folks have. And at the same time, uh, the community needs to be able to kind of experiment and innovate as well. So it's not, um, I don't think it's super simple, but I think that we're very open on how we work and do that innovation. So our open source and standards working together, the practice um, that we'll work with is get open source software and standards working together. So the spec forms a contract promise to the developers, ensuring that when they use the projects, they know what to expect and what guarantees are being made. And then our working group will work together to define this. And uh, we have Andy Waffa, who's here, and he is one of the chairs for our UXL Foundation Working Group. So Andy, if you could just raise your hand and maybe folks can talk to you as well. So, and alongside that, we're gonna use the open source projects to help guide the specification. So the developers working on these projects alongside developers using the projects are really in the best place to understand what the spec needs to evolve. And we are happy to have this evolve. We don't think it's just, you know, kind of like, boom, this is it. We're open to feedback and we really want the community involvement and engagement. And so the working group is really focused on that. We have Robert Cohn, who's our spec editor, and then Andy uh, is chair for our working group, 
open source working group. So we feel like by combining the best of both worlds, we can effectively uh, use the speed of the open source development with the predictability of standards. So that's how we see them working together. And this collaboration is the most important thing. We need to make sure that the groups and maintainers are working together. And the working group should ensure that there's a robust and efficient way for developers to bring new features and APIs to the project, and then everybody can be informed of what's going on. So compatibility across vendors and architectures. One of the important things we're trying to achieve is cross-vendor compatibility. So it's really important that developers experience the same behavior across vendor processors. And so to do this, we really need to have robust tests and testing. And so where a vendor's not implemented a particular API, it's important that the developer understand this, and ideally, there's a fallback provided. So we're, we're looking at how we can do that, and the spec has to be designed in a way that can be consistent across all these different processor vendors. And so I think the spec acts as the contract, and the tests have to be able to cover that contract to ensure compatibility. And then to achieve this compatibility, you know, we're working with our members to implement continuous integration for projects that run when changes are made to the project. So by having a broad set of devices to test on and a good set of tests, we can ensure that there's good compatibility across vendor. And this is really building an infrastructure that can be used to test on a set of devices, but the tests have to be implemented and um, to ensure the contract is really adhered to, if you will. And then we're working on common goals with other foundations and bodies. So, you know, we have just created our foundation. It's relatively new. But Kronos, uh, I guess, are, are many of you guys familiar with the Kronos Foundation? Yeah, some. Okay. So uh, we have big dependencies with C++ and really a lot with the SICL standard. And so SICL is an open standard defined by the Kronos group. And the UXL projects use DPC++, which is a compiler that implements SICL and is based on the LLVM compiler project. So the projects are built using a C++ compiler and DPC++ SICL compiler. So that means that we are able to bring use cases, feedback, and requirements to the SICL standard. And so we're working, and eminently we will probably be uh, formalizing a liaison agreement with the Kronos Group and the UXL Foundation to ensure that we're representing, uh, represented within the SICL community and can bring that feedback back to the standard. And this involves individuals from the Foundation taking on formal roles within SICL and vice versa. So it brings some challenges in relation to IP. But the Kronos Group exists to protect its members from issues relating to IP and all IP is donated to the Kronos Group, so it can be licensed to anyone. So it's important that we bring this feedback and um, kind of don't compromise the Kronos model as we're working. Alongside this, we're also trying to set up alliances with other groups. For example, the PyTorch uh, framework uses one of the UXL Foundation projects, uh, one DNN. So we want to ensure that the feedback from the PyTorch developers is brought to the UXL Foundation so we can make this integration successful. And then recently, we have a couple members of our steering committee who are very, very interested in Edge and Edge AI, and they're very interested in automotive. So we started working with AutoWare, which is a project for self-driving software simulation. And we're hoping to collaborate on some demos to show the integration of the libraries in that. So the type of alliances vary depending on what it is. But SICL is very strategic because it really helps power the libraries. The AutoWare would help us expand our community and reach new verticals. So it's important to think about what's strategically important in your foundation and what it is that you want to do to reach out to new communities and also enable the latest new technology or frameworks. So building the community. So we've been at 1API, I would say, you know, since for five years, going on five years. So over those five years, we've thought about how do we build out this community to be effective? And the community drives everything we do. So having a strategy to bring more people to the community is super important. And we kicked off uh, in 2019 with our technical advisory board. 
Then in 2020, we had the spec come out. Then we also did some dev summits. We also have spent a lot of time working on academic engagement because we feel like academia is a place where a lot of researchers are doing cool work where they can try out stuff. And uh, so we have centers of excellence. We have a student ambassador program. We also have One API innovators and teaching kits and curriculums. And we've done a bunch of One API hackathons along the way as well. So there's been work that's been done over the last four to five years innovating on One API in a variety of different use cases. And that is something that we're looking at. How do we migrate some of this work over to the UXL Foundation so we can continue to have that momentum uh, move forward? So these are some of the centers of excellence. And I encourage you to take a look at oneapi.io. There's a number of um, former developer uh, summits where speakers from many of these universities have presented papers and talks and things like that. And you can see exactly what they've been doing with different elements of One API. And we also have a pretty big footprint at some of the big universities. So you can see that we've done, you know, student ambassador programs at some of these places, an educator program. We have a lot of curriculum that is out there. So I think that's been very important for us to get the next generation kind of using this and, and recognizing what they can do with open source. And then also how do they impact standards? So it makes it seem as easy as one, two, three, but it really is not. <laughs> so I, I want to say that it could be easy, but we do want to move fast while keeping promises to the developers. So embrace open and really try to drive that. And we are working towards this compatibility across multiple vendors. But as you know, we'll have to get the testing set up, the machines. There's just a lot of work to be done there. And then working on common goals and doing alliances with uh, other foundations and bodies. So that's pretty much what our goal is for UXL. And we see that you know, we really want people to be inspired by open source and what we can do together as a community. And that's what this whole conference obviously is about. But then the alliances amongst different foundations and how we work together to actually impact change and move quickly is, is equally important. So one of the things I'd like to do is invite you guys to join us. So here we have a couple uh, places you can take a look at the uxlfoundation.org and oneapi.io. And then we also have a mailing list through Linux Foundation where you can sign up and you can join our SIGs on language, AI, math, and oh yeah, we have a hardware SIG, obviously, so. Oh, and, and safety critical. We just launched a safety critical SIG. Yeah, thank you. And we also have a Slack uh, group that you can join. So we're very, very open to collaborating, hearing from you, and, and we look forward to some questions if you have any. Come up with questions for anybody. So, uh, so I'm not familiar with UXL. So thank you for the talk. Um, and I don't mean this to be a hard question. And so sorry if it is, but because I don't know. If it's um, a hard question, I'm going to defer to uh, Jory or sure. Andy. Okay. That's what I'm doing. Um, so it's okay. So Any question's good. You, you, yeah, you mentioned that uh, programmers want to code in languages they already know, which I agree with. That lots of foundations and stuff say that, and that tells me there's probably a bunch of opportunities for synergy and alliances. You then made a statement that says there's a dependency on C++. That seems to be a contradiction because developers that are moving to Rust, ones that know Go, and so on. So other foundations, have you looked at partnering with, say, the Rust Foundation? Have you looked at partnering with the EBPF Foundation, which says We've, we want to have the same APIs accessible in multiple languages? So it's really, are you looking at language agility is really the question. Language agility is great. We actually had that topic come up this morning at our steering committee meeting, which was at 7 this morning. And we talked about C++ and Rust. So Andy. Do you want to grab a mic from the back table so you don't have to jump oh. up? Oh. We make Andy come up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so the, the short answer is yes, uh, in having that be more portable. Uh, so not only do we want to be able to address a myriad of hardware um, from a myriad of vendors, etc., we also want people to use what they want to use, whether it be Rust, Go, JavaScript, whatever, right? Um, it Currently, it's C++. We have to kind of grease the wheels and educate, etc., and then people can then adopt whatever language they want. 
with regards to your question of have we looked at partnering with, say, the Rust Foundation or whatever, no, um, we haven't. Doesn't mean we won't. Just at this moment in time, not yet. Which one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Right. Right. I mean, literally, we just, we just got up and running in September. So we, we have lots of opportunities to collaborate, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for that. That was a great talk. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I've been tr sort of tracking this space, um, you know, open source AI software stacks is important to us at the FreeBSD Foundation and to members of our community. Um, and there's a variety of solutions out there. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is uh, the, the performance metrics that you see. Um, so I guess I would be interested in any thoughts you have or can share on, you know, where you see UXL being particularly applicable. You talked a lot about university and I agree. And I think that's very interesting because, uh, yeah, for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, are there segments where you think given UXL's performance profile and you know capabilities today, you think it's really well suited? I would say right off the bat, I mean, I did refer to this uh, blog by Kentaro Kawakami, and he did actually in public at one of our AI SIGs or AI technical advisory boards, talk a little bit about the performance numbers that they were getting for inference and I think both training. And so there are some numbers out there. I wouldn't say that I could give you a specific answer. Um, it really depends on each use case and it depends kind of on what hardware you're using. There's so many dependencies. So, and it depends on the element that you're using. But I have heard, and I'm, you know, I, I have to go back and look, that um, with some of the studies that have been done, there was close to equal performance from NVIDIA GPUs to other. So I think that I'd have to just dig a little bit more, but it's very dependent on the use case, the workload, et cetera. There's yeah. Massive... Right. Andy, do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, it, uh, it's not a huge delta at the moment. Um, as far as areas of uptake, there's not, I can't say on the uptake, however, the interest is areas of uh, where you've got a huge number of different components deployed. Uh, so think of automotive as an example, right? Uh, you've got a number of different components. All of it needs some form of acceleration. It all needs to hook in somehow or whatever else. I dare say an extension of automotive would kind of be robotics. Uh, depending on the kind of robotics, so you've got the the OpenCV acceleration aspect piece and and that sort of stuff. So that's kind of I think where the benefit shines for something like UXL. Like if you just Google it, one API's implementation of Sickle achieves close to native performance on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. But I don't want to be the, you know, that's Google. Yes. I'm very interested in about the relationship between Kronos and Cycle. What is the relationship? Between be, Kronos and UXL? And with UXL. So, um, so Kronos houses the Cycle spec, and we've met with the head of the Kronos Foundation, and we're working on an alliance agreement so that we will work together and we will try to have representation from UXL on the Kronos side, and we will also be able to give some information back and forth. So we, we are going to announce something soon. Maybe, maybe even tomorrow. 
I mean, it might be on Tuesday, uh, next week. We are planning on talking about this uh, agreement, and uh, we have a blog written that's already improved, and so we are working together. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think that, you know, as we work together, we'll have to define areas of collaboration, the feedback that we're getting that we're able to share, et cetera. So um, we're, we're working through that now. Yeah. And I would just say that um, we're very engaged. So, so Andrew Richards has been very involved in Sickle for a very, very long time and has deep relationships with the Kronos group. And he's the CEO of Codeplay, and he also works very closely with our foundation. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more about that? No. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Are you guys tired after a great week, or how are you guys doing? Can you tell Jory never to give me the after lunch slot again on the last day? No, I'm just kidding. OK, thanks, guys.